Were the FAA and United Airlines complicit in a cover-up? Certainly there was a cover-up. Uh, whether they communicated behind the scenes uh, w to come up with this story, I can't say. Uh, but they both denied any knowledge of the existence of, of these uh, reports. There's radio evidence to show that they knew about it on November 7th. These taped conversations from November 7th between the control tower and United employees revealed the entire story. Initially, tower officials sound skeptical as the first reports are relayed. My initial impression from listening to the tower audio was that it must be very strange for them to actually be faced with uh, the possibility that they have a UFO over their airport. But as reports from the ground continue to be received, the tone of the tower officials changes from skeptical to concerned. Some of our pilots on the ground were reporting a UFO sighting at 1,000 feet from the sea side of the airport. Did you guys hear anything about that? You know what, the ramp tower called me, I want to say about 10, 15 minutes ago. We have not seen anything up there. Okay. But we will uh, surely keep an eye out, that's for sure. We're listening to the incident, the real voices of real people from the tower talking to United employees who say they saw something over their heads and it was a UFO. While the tower grapples with unconfirmed reports, several eyewitnesses finally step forward. Somebody observed a flying disc about a thousand feet above the uh, Charlie 17. You see anything over there? Uh, we saw it a half hour ago. Who saw it? A whole bunch of us over at the uh, Charlie Concourse. Really? You guys did? Who's this? The United Mechanics. Mechanic. Now, area pilots are warned. Somebody reported a UFO or a flying disc above Charlie Concourse. So nobody should see it, but use caution. Uh, 668, you can use Alpha and Northport and use caution for the uh, UFO. The O'Hare incident is not the first UFO sighting near an airport. 1978, at McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas, both pedestrians and a pilot see a disc-shaped UFO with glowing white lights. And 1997, over JFK Airport in New York, a Swiss Air 747 barely misses a glowing white cylindrical object traveling at a high rate of speed. One organization that did do a thorough investigation of the November 7th sighting is NARCAP, the National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena. As an organization, NARCAP deals exclusively with pilots and air traffic controllers who report UAPs, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. Bill meets with NARCAP Executive Director Ted Rowe. Why did you get involved in the Chicago O'Hare case? The Chicago O'Hare case involved an unidentified aerial phenomena that intruded into Class B restricted airspace over the sea terminal at O'Hare and very clearly represented an aviation safety hazard. Class B airspace extends to 10,000 feet above America's busiest airports. These areas are thoroughly monitored by air traffic control and all aircraft must obtain clearance before entering. Unidentified aircraft pose a significant problem. There is no contingency in place for pilots, air controllers, or radar operators when it comes to dealing with unidentifieds. You're saying that UAPs represent a threat to air traffic safety, especially in the case of O'Hare. NARCAP investigators write an exhaustive 155-page report on the incident. They conclude, quote, an official government inquiry should be carried out. Had this uh, phenomenon moved into lanes of oncoming air traffic, it could have resulted in catastrophe. How could an object make its way undetected through one of the most monitored and controlled airspaces in the world? 
Ted is about to take a flight into O'Hare to see just how secure this airspace is. Could some sort of craft penetrate Chicago O'Hare airspace? While a video reveals how close these encounters can really become. The team is in Chicago, Illinois, investigating the report of a disc-shaped UFO that was seen by United Airlines personnel on November 7, 2006, at O'Hare International Airport. Illinois has been a magnet for reported UFO activity in recent years. Previous investigations have examined the mass sighting of a huge triangular formation of lights over the nearby suburb of Tinley Park in 2004 and the intense pursuit of another triangular craft in southern Illinois by five different police departments in 2000. Now, the UFO sightings have come to the state's largest city and one of the busiest airports in the world. The strange object seen at O'Hare allegedly hovered over gate C-17 in the United Concourse for about 15 minutes before reportedly rising rapidly into the cloud cover leaving a round hole in its wake. But how could this object have entered this highly controlled area in the first place? The skies above Chicago O'Hare are some of the most closely monitored in the world. Ted is about to stage a flight to see how even a small plane must go through intense scrutiny in approaching this airport. The purpose of the flight is really to put to the test whether or not some sort of craft could penetrate Chicago O'Hare airspace without going through these various levels of air traffic control and radar coverage. Controlled airspace around the world is organized as imaginary cylinders that fit around airports. The cylinders get narrower as aircraft descend to lower altitudes and make their approach. If mapped out, they look like an upside down wedding cake at each successive layer of the wedding cake, the degree of communication with the control tower and the demands on the pilot increase. Scott Schweider, a local flight instructor, will help Ted navigate his way into O'Hare. Now getting in there isn't gonna be easy. Right. They're gonna have to move a lot of, move a lot of traffic for us. It'll be busy. <laughs> Ted is flying out of Chicago Executive Airport, about 10 miles north of O'Hare. 3-4, cover takeoff. Here we go. All right, ready to go. After receiving clearance from Chicago Executive's tower, Ted ascends to 3,000 feet at the bottom of the third tier. As he nears O'Hare, he is contacted by Chicago Approach Control before descending to 2,000 feet and the second layer. In this layer, he is being constantly watched by tower personnel and by radar. He receives two more contacts before reaching the lowest tier, where he is finally handed off to Chicago O'Hare's tower. Somewhere around maybe five or 10 nautical miles, we switch over to the tower control Change to 126.9 now. Monitor that frequency. It's a very smooth handoff to the air traffic controllers, and they see us on the radar, they see our altitude. 